So thanks so much for joining us this morning uh, to this Ask Microsoft Anything session on the cloud. The Fast Track team will be running through some materials. And so without further ado, let's just get started. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Bree, Praveen and the Fast Track team. Thanks so much. Hello. Thanks for joining the call today. Um, so I'm Praveen um, and I have Sanjeev and Arthur. So we are from Fast Track, Dynamics Fast Track team. Uh, so today we'll be attempting to answer your questions. And uh, before that, we'll start with a brief intro about the migration process. And then uh, we can just get into the Q&A sessions. So the the Microsoft, uh, the, if, you, if you look at the slide now, so the Microsoft engagement, so what? how can you leverage uh, Microsoft here uh, for this on-prem to online migration? So, so from the fast track uh, factory team, uh, the purpose of this team is to help you with these migrations. So we are going to just uh, accept your database that you're going to upload from the on-prem. And then we are going to convert the database into the online version of your environment uh, that you can continue to use and you can implement your, uh, you can deploy your solutions and then you can start using it as soon as the migration is complete. And Microsoft here is going to help uh, during the process of the migration as well as even before the migration when you are required to complete certain prerequisites uh, to be able to upload the database to us. And from the customer and partner's point of view, uh, you are required to complete this complete um, the functional uh, migration part, which is both a pre and post migration part. So what, what it means is that we are going to share the list of prerequisites that you are going to complete before uploading the database to us. And you are going to assess uh, uh, the environment to see uh, what kind of uh, changes are available in the online environment that you'll be impacted uh, once you migrate. So you have to remediate those before you uh, upload the database to us. And post-migration, you again have to just go through um, the migrated environment and making sure that everything is working fine. And you also have the post-migration steps like deploy your updated solutions and then start validating the environment and start using it um, and rolling it out to the users uh, on your end. So that's the process. Uh, the the Microsoft uh, is definitely available here to handle you during this migration process so that you don't have to worry about the automated process um, that we deploy here and how things work on it. So we can de definitely de uh, discuss more on the process once we start, once you start engaging with us, then um, we will show you those steps. And uh, the, when, it, when you actually get into the crux of this process, so you have the SMA team, the Dynamics Standard Migration Assessment team, that's going to take a look at your on-prem environment and assess the environment to find out what all you need to work on before you actually migrate the database or before you upload the database to us. So what are the deprecations that you need to address? What are those features that you are used to in the on-prem which doesn't exist in the online anymore? And what alternatives you have in the online environment that you can leverage? So all these are uh, very clearly presented in the assessment report. And then with the help of that report, you can take uh, remediation steps so that as part of preparing for this migration. And uh, as a next step, as I mentioned earlier, so from Microsoft uh, OP2L factory team, uh, we are going to accept your database and we are going to stage your database and convert an on-prem uh, SQL database to online SaaS service that you can leverage. So the next step would be for you to chime in, complete the functional uh, migration part, deploy your solutions, validate if everything is working fine. And then factory team is always available. If you find any issues at that point, so you, we can reach out to us so that we can help you with those uh, issues that you uncover. And then as a final step, you can always uh, train your users and then you can also make sure that the users have access to the environment that has been migrated. And we will be doing uh, multiple such dry runs uh, before you actually upgrade your production migration. Right? So, you, so before you actually attempt your production migration, we'll be running certain dry runs so that you will know what to expect out of this uh, migration process. So it's not going to be a surprise for you. So you will have ample um, opportunities for you to just uh, find out how the migration process is going to work out, how you have to remediate those issues that we are going to come across during this migration process, things like that.
And if you look at this uh, standard migration process, so if you look at this uh, this slide, current slide that we are projecting here, you have to back up the on-prem database, and even before that, you have to complete the prerequisites that we are going to share with you, and then upload the database to um, uh, LCS tool. So we will talk more about those tool once we start uh, working on this migration process. So once you upload the tool, the next step is to actually stage your database. If you're coming from CRM 2015 or CRM 2011, so we can't directly upgrade that to the online environment. We have to make sure that you, you your on-prem database is on the latest on-prem version which is available in the market. Um, then we will stage the database in that upgrade box that you see there. And then eventually your database will be migrated to online. Once, uh, so for this, when you upload the database, upgrading the environment as well as landing your database in the online environment, so during these three steps, uh, the factory team is going to support you. And we'll be taking care of that process from our side. And we'll be posting you updates on where you are in that process. The post-migration, again, and the functional um, changes that you have to uh, implement before you start using the environment, especially like deploying updated solutions and making sure that the UCI is enabled and things like that. And and you have to, uh, once the validation is complete, if everything is working fine, you have to reach out to your users and call the environment as a go live. Right. And then, um, so if you look at the partner and uh, customer responsibility below, so those are the things that you should be doing on your end. The factory team can provide some guidance in these uh, areas, but it's completely the customer and partner's responsibility to own and complete those steps. Um, so from the engagement point of view, the scope of uh, work that a factory team is going to help you with is lifting and shifting your database and also converting the database into the version that you uh, that you would like to use in the online environment. That's that's the ownership from the Microsoft uh, that we talked about earlier. Can we move on to the next slide? Yeah, so that's the process in the nutshell. Um, so just start uh, asking your questions and then we are happy to answer. So Praveen, we have a number of questions coming in through the chat, but I wanted to take the ones that we got uh, ahead of time first uh, through our, our survey. So the first one there is some of the dynamic CRM versions are coming to are coming up on end of support soon. What does this mean for me if products are out of mainstream support versus end of extended support? What happens if I migrate to the cloud after a support date? So if you migrate uh, to the cloud after the support end date is uh, after the end date, uh, the end of life of that particular version is over, we'll continue to receive uh, the all the features that you uh, that we roll out in the online environment. However, we have to uh, keep in mind that there are certain versions that we are going to deprecate uh, while we are on this migration journey. CRM 2011 is already end of life. Uh, so we have not announced the date yet, but soon we are going to stop supporting CRM 2011. CRM 2013 and CRM 2015 on-prem versions are still supported. Now, as I mentioned, like you will continue to receive all the online features after the migration is complete without any issues. Okay, great. Uh, here's one for about online limits. And Sanjeev, maybe you can answer this one. Um, we use some process. We use some processes with uh, quite many uh, fetch XML queries. Um, then for six months, Microsoft would not th throttle this. Uh, respectfully, could you go through like? You sh could you go through with the limits turned off? Um, is it possible to? measure on-prem uh, whether we can run into these limits? D does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. This is a great question, actually. So, and we have received this uh, common theme, uh, like the question of this common nature from uh, many customers and partners who are moving from on-premise to online. 
Uh, so let me step back and explain uh, like how our online um, uh, really works. So uh, any interaction with online environment uh, that is DHS to one environment is via APIs. Uh, contrary to what we have in on-prem, there is an option in on-prem of interacting with the CRM system via filtered views. Uh, as you all know, that is not possible in the online world. So any interaction through to the Dynamics 365 CRM online environment is through API. The API might be of different nature. For example, there could be an API calls through a web uh, web API endpoint, or somebody could be executing fetch XML, which also goes through the same uh, essentially the same endpoint. And even the in the API consumptions through the TDS endpoints uh, through a SQL Server Management Studio, which might seem like we are connecting to the backend SQL, is actually going through the API. So all the interactions, that is execution of fetch XML, web API, or any other queries, will be counted towards the um, towards the API entitlements and limits. Uh, however, uh, we have now increased the user entitlements for running the queries and limits. So for example, if an user is executing a fetch-based report, they are now have more API entitlement. So we are not seeing this in a, a big concern. Um, but the cloud best pat practice and the pattern that we're recommending the customer, if there is a, uh, a very complex report, Power BI will be the right solution instead of having a uh, SSRS based report or a fetch XML based report. Yeah, I hope that answered the question here. Yeah. Uh, so any transaction, including the fetch XML, uh, will be counted to a API, but we have adequate uh, API entitlement for every users to cover those kind of uh, use cases and scenarios. Here's another one for you, Sajeev, um, on audit logs. We are required to, or by audit, to keep our audit logs for as long as a person is a customer with us. Is there a solution available to automatically offload audits to a cheaper non-dynamic storage? Uh, yeah, I I think the question was uh, uh, before the audit was moved to the log. Now with the latest release that is from last couple of months, uh, the audit information is actually stored outside the Dynamics 365 the relational database. That is the audit logs are no longer stored in the SQL database underlying. It is stored in the uh, sister uh, storage, which is a blob storage. So it is being moved to more cost effective uh, storage. And as you all know, the log storage uh, cost is the lowest among all the three, that is uh, database, file, and the uh, log storage. So underlying is blob. So it is actually going to be very economical for customers to keep the audit logs in the blob but they are uh, very like the, they are the most economical stories that we have offered among the three. Great. Um, this one I'm going to pass back to the group. Uh, and it's so we're, we're going to go to the ones in the chat now. Um, would you please discuss expected experiences when a customer is moving from uh, 8.x to 9.x online? We have upgraded one of our customers from eight to nine on premise, and there's quite a bit of out of the box features were added. Is this handled differently with the OP2L process? I can take that. So the the, the OP2L process uses uh, it's like a lift and shift. We are complete. We are. It's not a selective data push that we are doing through this migration. So we are doing the entire database migration. So that. Um, so all the out-of-box features that are implemented in the online environment uh, will be applicable to you once the migration is complete through this process. Uh, I like to just add on, uh, Praveen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the out-of-the-box features, since it's complete database migration, it does move. Uh, however, there are certain features of on-prem. Uh, like knowledge articles and a few other features which have been deprecated in online. So we do recommend customer to validate those things uh, and also the ribbon customization, sitemaps. 
just to validate because there are certain things which we have now in the cloud world a better alternative the new enhanced versions are available so if you find that uh, the the on premise features are not working please do upgrade it to the latest online features to take the benefit of our d365 cloud so this next one from Ravi, uh, I think it's really talking about the, you know, how do you handle, how do you modernize customizations? Um, is there a tool the customer could use to understand the depth of work required based on existing customizations? And if the customer is not on the latest release? I can take that for me. Uh, yeah, so it's actually a very good question. It has been asked in the chat also. Uh, so the typical workflow, if I step back and explain how the migration, successful migration really happens. Uh, so for the from the planning perspective, what we recommend customers, that the first migration, which we re uh, request customers to take the dev, or actually if prod is uh, also having unmanaged solution, so we request customers to start with the broad database uh, backup and do the online migration. So in the first migration, we recommend customers that allocate enough time to validate all the business critical customization. So that includes a sitemap, a ribbon, uh, fetch XML reports, uh, plugins, workflow and everything. Once those are validated and tested in some scenarios, yes, there might have, uh, there have to be few things that has to be remediated, few things that has to be changed. Uh, however, this will be done only once in this first, uh, let's call it as a dev migration. So that's why it's important that as part of the project planning, we allocate enough time for the validation and testing for the first migration uh, because every customer's customization is different. So it's very difficult to have a ballpark figure for like, okay, this customization will take X days to remediate. Uh, so what we recommend that in the first migration, let's have all the solutions, all the customization remediated so that we don't have any errors. In the second migration onwards, even if we know that those known issues are there, what will happen is that since we have already remediated the solutions in the first dev migration, all we have to do is export those solutions and import in the subsequent migrated environments. So it will override the old customization, old solutions, which uh, might not be working with the latest working copy of the solution. So that will remediate the customization, ribbon, workflows, plugins, and all the other things. So it's very critical that first migration, we plan it very well and we remediate all the issues. So that's why it's important that first migration, we usually request customer to take the production backup because we know if the issues and if productions are remediated the subsequent migrations will be much smoother and easier essentially so the it will be just one time uh, effort and uh, it will pay dividends for all the future migrations of the same uh, database um another one that i thought would be good in the group or for the group, right? Like I think we who we've answered it here in the chat already. But uh, the question was essentially, you know, what are some of the common and maybe let's even broaden it a little bit. What are some of the things that we need to do to prepare for our, you know, migration to the cloud? What are some of, some of those common um, items that we see across organizations? Uh, so let let's start there, and then we can tackle the person's actual question. Yeah. So. I can paste you the link of the white paper that we published. It has a list of all the prerequisites that you must complete. And these are the very common um, uh, changes that we request customers to complete uh, before uploading the database to us. And then Praveen, the, the, the question was really around what are the, some of the challenges that an organization might see um, when migrating to the cloud? Can you talk a little bit about some of the common challenges? Right, if, if they're if they're not following our checklist in terms of getting prepared, yeah. what? So, so some of the challenges that we have seen is the recommendations uh, not being followed accurately. Uh, that's the biggest challenge that I see uh, from most of the customers. Especially, we ask customers to uh, convert the plugins into the sandbox mode, and that will be missed out. And if if that actually leads to the migration to fail, 
Um, and then the other thing that I have seen uh, pretty frequently is that the report, the SSRS reports, um, the custom reports must be converted to fetch XML mode uh, because the direct queries are not um, are not going to work in the online environment. So not making such changes will only delay the migration. And um, the other important thing that I've seen is like often not looking at how much storage we have subscribed to. Um, so we, we uh, just go ahead and kick off the migration and then we'll run out of storage capacity. So it's really important for us to see on, on the customer and the partner side, especially like to see how much storage uh, capacity we have subscribed to and how many environments we are trying to migrate and what is the size of each one of them that will uh, do like doing basic math will tell us how much storage we have and how many en uh, environments we can totally migrate there uh, even during the dry run phase. So such that you will not have, you will not be surprised to see that you are running out of space and all. It's, it's going to be pretty common uh, issues that we face. That's great. Um, so Stephen asks, um, does the online does Dynamics three sixty five connect to Microsoft Language Cognitive Services Omnichannel Power Virtual Agent for chatbot setup? So really field service, right? Like call center uh, type question. Um, yeah, I can take that. Yes, yeah. So uh, answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, after migrating the on-premise environment, the environment is completely cloud uh, enabled. So that means customers can connect to omni-channel, to PV to Azure Voice, anything that is possible in online it will be available. Those features will be available to the migrated environment. Here's another one. Let's see. Um, we're using many processes that use a direct connection to the CRM database itself. We query tables directly to or directly and creates uh, custom views by using standard tables. Will it be possible when we move to the cloud, or will this be, I guess they, they're really asking, will this be possible when we move to the cloud? And then can we still use CRM SDK to write plugins? Um, I think this is two part question. So uh, let yep. me answer each of them individually. Uh, so the first part of the question, uh, do we have direct access, access to the CRM database? Uh, no, uh, we don't have in the cloud world, we don't give direct access to the underlying database. However, the common pattern that we have seen is uh, customers enable Azure Synapse link for database, in short, ESL database, export the data. Uh, and then they uh, can write. So once the data is exported, it can be targeted to SQL manager instance or dedicated SQL database, and they can definitely write uh, the views and uh, then uh, consume that data directly. Um, um, and the second part was, uh, uh, there are, um, um, sorry, I missed <laughs> Tom. What was the second part? of the Oh yeah, sorry. The second part was, can we still use CRM SDK to write plugins? Uh, yes, yeah. So the SDK version needs to be up, up, upgraded to the latest uh, versions. Um, but yes, yes, it is possible to write plugins using the latest SDK. And Visual Studio 2019 do support the um, the plugin explorer. So if customers have option to uh, install Visual Studio 2019, they will be able to write plugins for online. Yep. So the next one here is really about um, who can participate not only in sort of OP2L but fast track services overall. If we're able, are we able to use fast track services if we migrate? If the migrated version won't be in production, uh, rather a live archive that we need to maintain for regulatory reasons. We already already have a separate production environment in the cloud but we didn't want to lift and shift dirty data into it. Hence, we needed to maintain it, this live archive. I can take that one. So, yeah, man, we can. So the 
uh, again, so you will not receive the full fast track engagement, the full fast track benefits here through this. So we'll have the factory team helping you migrate your on-prem instance online. So it must be a CRM instance in the on-prem for us to be able to migrate it to online. If you have one, uh, irrespective of number of users that you are migrating, we can still help you with that migration. Here's another one, Praveena, and I'm not quite sure what they're asking, um, but it says, I've heard starting from one user on-prem, the customer partner can get help from Microsoft, fast, the, from you guys, the Fast Track team. I just want to know, is, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, so this, again, yeah, so we, uh, for the... For the OP2L factory team, we don't really, uh, there's no limit on number of users. Even if you have one user, as you called out, uh, whoever is asking this question. So we can still help you migrate your on-prem instance online. Uh, but that's not going to be a full fast track engagement. So that's a separate uh, qualification criteria for the fast track ones. But we 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 are from fast track team, but uh, the OP2L factory team that we run will help you uh, with those migrations. Yeah, don't don't worry about the number of users you have. Even if you have one user or the five users, you can just onboard uh, into this program. Great. And then it looks like there was a oh uh, our our eight x to nine x online question had a clarification, but it looks like we answered that one in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll just skip that for now, and then. Let's see. Um, so the last question that I currently see here in the chat is, do we have direct access to database, to the database? How do we handle the custom, how do we handle custom tables? For example, have some custom tables for our loyalty program. Would they have custom tables for their loyalty program? So they're wondering how do they handle that? Um, yeah, I, I, I can yeah. take that. I mean, yeah, so I think it's the same pattern uh, uh, which we recommend is called ESL, Azure Synapse Links for Dataverse. Uh, once the data is moved um, uh, from the cloud environment to um, uh, to the uh, Azure Synapse, either the the blob storage, not the blob storage, the file storage, or and then it is moved to any of your SQL instance, you can definitely have... Um, your custom tables there um, and our sync is almost near real time because all the changes are tuned in and the sync is happening throughout the like it's 24 hours it's syncing the data from the um from crm environment the cloud environment to the azure synapse link for database uh, even the name suggests uh, the azure synapse uh, uh, workspace is optional it can also write directly to the azure data link um, and from data lake, it can be consumed down to any of the relation database, managed SQL instance or a dedicated SQL server, where custom views, custom tables, all those things can be added easily. Sanjeev, maybe we can answer this one as well. Um, is it possible to run SQL select scripts against filtered views? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So we do have ability even in cloud to run SQL queries. Uh, it's called TDS endpoint, which is in preview right now. Uh, but it is not the direct SQL statement that customers might be uh, used to in the on-prem world. It, it still goes through the API. Essentially, all the SQL queries that is uh, executed is translated into internal APIs and then executed and uh, the results are translated back. So there is limitations of uh, ATMB size and all those things. But yes, uh, there is a preview feature which can allow customers to query in a SQL fashion. Uh, but that's not uh, meant for heavy usage. That's just for end user scenario. Uh, the best pattern if we have to really query lots of data will be through Azure Synapse Link for Dataverse. <laughs> So that, it looks like we've answered everything that I can see in the chat. Um, and I know that we folks on the, you know, on the team here have answered other questions as we, as we're going along. So hopefully we've got to 
most everyone's questions, uh, either if it was provided ahead of time or here, you know, live. Um, Praveen, Sanjeev, is there anything else, you know, that we should or organizations should be thinking about um, as, as they consider moving sure. to the cloud? Yes, I think Praveen, there is a question for GCC. If you want to touch on that, uh, there is something for uh, justice and public safety. So if there is some information on the GCC also that you want to share with the team. Yeah. So uh, let me check the question. Um, this, oh yeah, yeah. So CJS uh, protected data. Yeah. So we we have um, the GCC support as well for these op 2 migrations, and uh, particularly for CJS protected data, we have migrations as well. So we have a dedicated team that uh, takes care of GCC customers in particular. So they will. I mean, they're part of the fast track team. So they will. To leverage the factory team to do these migrations uh, but yes we support cgis as well anything else praveen anything else that we should be organizations should be thinking about as they move to the cloud i, I think we've answered all the questions that i can see but uh yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that I just briefly touched upon earlier was the storage, uh, So the, which I hear as a frequent and very regular concern. Um, so storage is something which is uh, a recurring expense in the online environment. So you need to be very, uh, you need to do the pre-planning before the migration around how much storage uh, um, capacity you are subscribing uh, versus the number of environments that you are attempting to migrate is one of the important math that you need to do. Um, and the second thing is um, the UCI. By now, like most of you are already familiar with this, switching over to UCI when you migrate online. So that is a very important step. And uh, once you complete the first dry run, you can actually uh, update all your solutions with uh, UCI and then test it out. Um, that is a very important and mandatory step. Uh, we have seen some customers surprised uh, looking at these changes. Uh, but uh, for most part, I think it's it's the the partners are also familiar that there's a change which is inevitable. Um, so that's something that you need to look at. So what are the features that are deprecated in the online environment versus or compared to your on-prem, and how you should be remediating them? Those are the biggest uh, challenges and biggest steps that you need to take as part of this migration. And uh, those are the questions that I hear quite often. So. And uh, the the one other, one other question that is very frequently asked is like how much um, how much uh, customer or part or primarily customer will end up paying for this program? Um, just want to let you know that for the on-prem to online migration pro program um, that the factory team is handling is uh, is is a free of cost. So be it the Azure resources that will consume as part of migrating your on-prem uh, workloads to online. And uh, the resources that we deploy to do this work, all this, uh, we're not charging anything for this. <laughs> so there's a licensing question. <laughs> yeah, so the, the licensing question, uh, I'll, we'll have to get back to them on, on the licensing question, right? Because licensing, I, we would need to know, so sorry. Thank you, Sanjeev. I, I meant to address this earlier. On the licensing question, um, we'll be sending out a survey after this if you want to send me your name and uh, specifics around your question uh we can certainly answer that but we don't have someone from licensing on the call so i thought you know giving a half answer or partial answer would would sort of be detrimental to the question um so happy to answer that offline so i i have one question that i would like to answer this is one of the frequently asked questions as well mm -hmm. so how about how do we handle this uh, employees that are no longer with the company and then yet they want to uh, make sure that they retain the ownership of those uh, the records that were created by the employees uh, who are not in the company anymore. The, um, so as part of this migration, one of the important things that we ask you to do is to map the users 
So mapping the users is nothing but if you have if you have 100 users in the on-prem environment, uh, as part of the migration, we are going to export all the 100 users into a CSV file, and we are going to let you choose the list of users that you would like to migrate online. And uh, out of 100 users, let's assume that you just want to bring only 20 of them online. So you have to map all those 20 users and then remove the rest of the users from the CSV file and upload it back to us. So when you do that, as part of the migration, these 20 users that you mapped will be syncing. And those are the 20 users that you see as enabled users. And the rest of the 80 users that you had in on-prem will still show up in the online environment as disabled users. So you will have those 80 users from the on-prem that created the records, they'll be retained. The ownership is retained, the time and date of creation of the record, everything is retained. The history is retained. Just that the user that you did not map will show up as an uh, inactive user. Hope I answered your question there. So that's very important uh, thing as a, a step as part of this migration, mapping the users. And the white paper link that we pasted in the chat uh, has uh, very detailed and clear steps on how you are going to map those users uh, uh, through this OP2L program. So, Praveen, uh, the next question here is from Jessica, and it's there's mul it's multi multi parts, but the part that I think we can answer now as part of the you know our discussion, right, is their database is rather large. Um, they're wondering, do you have any best practices on how to clean up their database? Yeah, so we have uh, some of those queries are published in the community forum as well on how to uh, clean up the databases and uh, things like that. And and uh, here in this case, particularly when you're talking about attachments, um, so attachments though, when, when you're in the on-prem, they're part of the relational database, as Sanjeev pointed out earlier, post-migration attachments will be moved out of your relational database and it will be transferred to the relatively cheaper storage option um, so that you will not end up paying as much as you pay for the relational data. So that is automated process that can be handled as a, a, as a post-migration step. Um, so if you still have an opportunity to clean up data, do you have uh, the, the commands, the T-SQL commands that are already posted in the community uh, chat. So again, uh, if uh, Tom mentioned that as part of the survey link, if you need additional information, do uh, mention that in that survey, uh, and then we will get back to you if you provide your details. Yeah. So Carl asks, um, we have a live API updates directly from our POS system. Um, let's see, what is the actual question? If if the custom if the custom tables are in Azure Synapse, that's, I don't know, for me, can you read that and interpret that? I'm not yeah. quite sure what they, uh... oh. I think it's, uh, it's related to the previously asked question. So the, 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 they have some uh, royalty program and the, uh, so the POS system leverages uh, API calls, but that if the data is sitting in Azure Synapse, how are how are they going to um, look at those custom tables during this uh, during the sale process? And do you have any idea? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I would. I think I should answer this right. Uh, this is actually a very good question. So the uh, the pattern that we are dealing with is that uh, in on prem. There are uh, custom tables where the, um, let's say the royalty rewards and DTS calculations are happening there. And those are shown to the Dynamics CRM user probably through some integration. The similar pattern can be leveraged even in online world. So uh, there are options where a customer can have their own database in, um, in Azure. For example, it could be Azure SQL Manage instance or dedicated data where all the loyalty uh, information uh, are being sent. Um, and uh, the data can be then again matched up with the data that is already present in the Azure Synapse. So that data can be exported in the same database or we can just join it from there. Um, and all those royalty information that is there in the custom tables can be surfaced via multiple avenues. 
So one example could be a custom page, which is a new features, which can use the SQL connector, bring in the loyalty information from the external table and surfaces to the end user. Uh, without needing that same data to be uh, in this uh, in the CRM environment, um, other options are also there. For example, a virtual entity which is based on a plugin model, or even an embedded Power BI dashboard. So for the Power BI dashboard can run on the royalty uh, royalty um, data and surfaces inside the uh, CRM system as a dashboard or as a report. So there are multiple avenues uh, to surface the external data uh, inside Dynamics 360 by CR. I think there was one Carl has updated uh, that there is a real-time integration. So real-time integration can also happen directly from the POS system to D365 online, uh, but the volume is definitely something that we need to consider. So if you're talking about uh, millions of POS transactions, so we have to evaluate if uh, those many transactions needs to be directly pushed into CRM or there could be different pattern uh, to be leveraged here. Um, you know, there, there are a number of vast stall for time as people put in the questions. Um, so there are a number of uh, resources, obviously, that we have out there on uh, around migration, um, you know, one of which is our, or where we try to centralize a lot of those resources is our migration community. Um, so if you're not aware, um, I think we have, maybe on the next slide, we have a, a link to our our community, but you're, there's a product forums there for both AX and CRM. Um, so if, if you have questions beyond today, obviously, um, you can certainly go to the, to the um, migration community and ask them there. Um, where, you know, folks like myself, Praveen, Sanjeev are actively, you know, we, we, we're the, we're the, many of the folks who, who help answer those questions along with, um, you know, SMEs from around, around the world, uh, are participate in, in those forums. So definitely uh, a resource that if you have questions as you continue on in your migration journey to, you know, please leverage, uh, and in addition to that, we, you know, we have resources on the OP2L factory, our TEI studies that we've done with Forrester on the value of moving to the cloud, a number of our webinars like this one will be posted there. So you can always refer back to um, them or, or share them with colleagues, right? So if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you for all of the great questions that we received, uh, almost 50 questions in total. Um, but yeah, as, as I mentioned, right, like if you're, if you're not aware, uh, we do have that Dynamics migration community, please join that, um, leverage those resources. We're continually, continually adding them, um, and, and new ones, uh, throughout the year. Um, and then if you have more, uh, if you have questions on the fast track team, the, the link is here as well. Um, that will also send you to. How, you know, how do we, how do we, um, nominate for the, the OB2L factory and other fast track guidance. So, uh, two great resources to, to leverage when you're considering the cloud. With that, I think I'll say, yeah, thank you. And thanks for participating and see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining today. Thank you everyone.